By Christmas 1920, Dublin was a city of contradictions. As the weather turned cold in mid-December, snow covered the city streets. Despite the escalating War of Independence, however, the city still had a festive feel. During the day, throngs of people made their way to the city's major shopping thoroughfares of Thomas Street, O'Connell Street and Grafton Street, where lavish displays adorned the shop windows. In the evenings, carriages ploughed through the frosty weather, bringing revellers to the customary fancy-dressed charity balls that were common at Christmas. However, beneath this thin veneer, an ugly atmosphere pervaded life in Dublin. The naive had hoped that the British authorities would temporarily relax the military curfew in place across Ireland, but this was never seriously entertained. As darkness fell over Dublin on Christmas Eve, there was no let-up in the violence that had dominated life over the previous year. By 10pm, military patrols were appearing on the streets and forcing people indoors. The ensuing silence was only broken by the occasional gunshot which echoed through the darkness. The incidents reported on that Christmas night had seen ex-British Army soldiers come under fire just a few metres from the pro-cathedral on Marlborough Street, while a few streets away someone attempted to set off a bomb in the offices of the Freeman's Journal newspaper. The mood that hung over Dublin that Christmas was perhaps best symbolised a week later during the final hours of 1920. In what had been a time-honoured custom, church bells traditionally rang across the city to welcome in the new year. However, as 1920 drew to a close, an eerie quietness hung over Dublin as the military curfew demanded no activities at night. Even Christchurch Cathedral, which had dominated Dublin city centre since 1026, stood silent. This wasn't tranquility, however. In the houses of both rich and poor, people couldn't but be apprehensive about what 1921 would bring. 1920 had been dominated by war and violence. Around 40 people had been killed in Dublin alone in the previous two months, and there was no reason to expect this would change in 1921. Yet, alongside their fears for the future, ordinary people across Ireland had a myriad of problems in their own personal lives. We often forget that while they may have lived through major historical events, which unquestionably shaped their lives, these intersected with many personal problems. In this first episode, as the War of Independence series returns after a break of three months, to ease us back into the story, I'll be focusing on a few individuals to explore how many people's struggles in day-to-day life continued even as wider society in Ireland appeared to be falling apart around them as the War of Independence consumed Ireland. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Ireland 1920, the War of Independence, Part 15. This podcast is the first episode in three months in the War of Independence series. So, rather than plunge straight into the midst of the war, I wanted to make a show that would ease us back into Ireland in the early 20th century. However, I also didn't want a show that would just be a direct recap of material already covered in the series to date. So this episode follows the lives of two people, Alice Morton and Bridget Carlin. These two women had wildly different experiences of life during the war. However, both had to deal with major personal issues as the conflict tore Irish society asunder. Alice Morton, as we're about to hear, would probably have become one of the most scandalous women of the age had her story not been obscured by the war. In 1918, she started an affair that would lead to three separate court cases and her effectively going on the run in 1919. Meanwhile, Bridget Carlin faced very different, indeed more fundamental problems as she struggled to survive during the conflict. After we hear Bridget's story, the episode will conclude by looking at what people did in their spare time. Basically, how did people entertain themselves in the midst of war? Now, along the way, I will mention most of the major events covered in the series to date, just to jog your memory on key points in the growing crisis engulfing Irish society as the war deepened. 
Now, the War of Independence series has undoubtedly been the biggest project I've embarked on since I started the podcast 11 years ago. Before I took the break about three months ago, I'd already published podcasts with scripts that totaled about 120,000 words. That's about the size of a 400-page book. Already, I have another six episodes ready to go. Now, this rate of publication is only possible because of the great team involved in this series. That's Sam who does the research, Jason on sound, and Aidan and Therese who bring the voices of the era to life in their narrations. Most of all though, it's the listeners who support the show on patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and Acast Plus who make this series possible because it's their support that has allowed me to bring on board this great team and create the series. If you are in a position to support the show and help produce a series like this one, you do get exclusive features as a way of saying thanks. Now, based on your feedback, lots of you don't like adverts. So on Patreon and Acast Plus, there are no adverts at all. You also get hours of bonus content too. For example, I've recently released episodes on the Knights Templar and the Nine Years War, and they're only available for listeners who support the show. If you want to get these bonus features and support my work, it's really easy to sign up at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast or at Acast Plus. There's links in the show notes below to both of these. Now to Ireland in 1920 and we'll begin with the life of Alice Morton. Alice Morton faced into Ireland's revolutionary period as far removed from radical politics as anyone in her generation could be. Born Alice Georgine Smith in 1891, she was the daughter of a wealthy soldier, Sir Arthur Smith, who had served as a major in the British Army. Throughout Alice's youth, the family's wealth and social standing, not to mention the luxurious surrounds of the 18-room family home at Ballant Temple, County Derry, left the Smiths with little sense and less understanding of why many Irish people demanded change at the time. Heavily unionist in their outlook, they had no sympathy for the nationalist views many of their neighbours and the wider population had. While 1913 spelled the beginning of a decade of revolutionary change as Dublin was convulsed by a long and bitter dispute when employers tried to violently break trade unions in the city, Alice Morton was settling into a very different life. In June 1913, she had married Robert Morton, the son of a wealthy mill owner from the town of Ballymena. Now, Morton was an ideal match for Alice. His family was also wealthy and conservative unionist in their views, just like her own. Indeed, her new husband, Robert, had gone as far as signing his name on the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant, a pledge to resist home rule by any means necessary. After their marriage, the couple moved into Orenmore House outside Ballymena, another large mansion, and Alice quickly fell pregnant, giving birth to their first child, a daughter, Frances, who was born on March the 18th, 1914. The first five months of this infant's life were the last Ireland would know of peace for nearly a decade. Indeed, within weeks of her birth, Ireland seemed to be approaching a civil war over the issue of home rule. While families like Alice's were implacably opposed to the concept, the vast majority of the Irish population wanted some form of increased autonomy from Britain at the time. With both sides willing to go to war over the issue, the crisis dragged on through the summer and as late as July 1914, newspapers in Ireland and across the world discussed what they thought would be the imminent civil war in Ireland. The island, however, was pulled back from the abyss of civil war only because a far greater conflict, the First World War, broke out in August 1914. After the declaration of war, both nationalist and unionist politicians, who had been on the brink of fighting each other, now rallied their supporters to fight for the British Empire. In total, 200,000 Irish men enlisted and a shocking 25% were killed in the war. In Alice Morton's own community of Ballymena, Large numbers of young men enlisted in what became known as the Ulster Division. For her part, Alice did her bit and began writing to a young soldier from the area, Robert Hansen, her husband's second cousin. This was common for women at the time to write letters to young soldiers, 
It was a way to maintain contact with home and comfort these young men far from their kith and kin. Despite the continued upheaval and dislocation caused by the war, Alice fell pregnant for a second time in January 1916. Four months later, Ireland would experience its first direct taste of conflict when militant Republicans organised the Easter Rising in Dublin. Alice, however, was far removed from this uprising and in September she gave birth to her second child, a boy named Nathaniel. The 1916 Rising, however, signalled an end to the last vestiges of peace in Ireland. Political tensions escalated rapidly in its aftermath. Despite widespread repression in the months following the revolt, it quickly became apparent that the Republican movement was going to be a force to be reckoned with in the following years. They won four by-elections in 1917 and led a mass movement opposing attempts to introduce military conscription in Ireland in 1918. During these increasingly fraught days, Alice Morton had far more pressing and personal concerns than politics. Through the course of the First World War, she had kept up correspondence with the young soldier, Robert Hansen, her husband's cousin. By the closing months of the war in 1918, their letters had become more frequent and intimate. When Hansen returned home on leave, he began to visit Alice frequently, often when her husband was not at home an increasingly common occurrence as he had enlisted in the army in 1916. The relationship between Alice and Robert Hansen developed into a full-blown affair as the First World War entered its final weeks. On August the 8th, 1918, she hosted a party at her house, which Hansen attended. Now at the last minute, Alice's husband was drawn away on business and in his absence, the party went ahead and continued into the early hours. After all guests had left, Robert Hansen returned to the house under the cover of darkness and climbed in the window of Alice's bedroom, where he remained for several hours. In what would prove a life-altering moment, the family chauffeur observed Hansen and informed Alice's husband of what had transpired. Now, adultery in itself was scandalous, not to mention the fact that Alice was conducting an affair with her husband's cousin. Following this incident, the relationship between Alice and her husband unsurprisingly deteriorated. He demanded to see the correspondence between Captain Hansen and Alice. When she refused, he began to secretly intercept their letters. These confirmed his suspicions given Robert Hansen was addressing Alice as my darling in one letter. This was all taking place to the backdrop of rapidly escalating tensions in Ireland. The First World War ended on November the 11th and within days a general election was called for the following month. In this bitter contest, an overwhelming majority of the Irish population voted for Republican candidates who had stood on a manifesto demanding full independence. A few weeks after the votes were counted, what is generally regarded as the opening shots of the war saw the Irish volunteers who would evolve into the IRA kill two policemen and rob a shipment of explosives at Solahead Beg in South Tipperary. Now while her country stood on the brink of a major uprising against British rule, Alice Morton was firmly focused on the rapidly rising tensions in her own household. While IRA volunteers like Dan Breen and Sean Tracy were gaining national fame, particularly after their exploits at the Knocklong ambush in May 1919, Alice Morton took the major decision to leave her husband. In response, he opted for what was a nuclear option. In what seems to have been an act of vengeance, he initiated divorce proceedings against Alice, while simultaneously taking what was called a suit of Crim Con against her lover, Captain Hansen. Crim Con was short for criminal conversation, in which Robert Morton would sue his cousin, Captain Hansen, for having what was deemed as improper relations with his wife. Basically, he was accusing the soldier of sleeping with Alice. While all parties were humiliated in the proceedings, there was no question Alice had the most to lose, as her sex life would be central to her husband's case. This court case was the start of a sensational scandal that would last right throughout the War of Independence. Even as bitter violence rocked the city of Derry, close to her childhood home, Alice's life was one shaped more by this scandal than the war. The trial opened in July 1919 in Belfast as large parts of Tipperary were placed under martial law. 
However, Alice had other concerns. The moment the trial began, it was clear the public would feast on her reputation. In an age where public discussion around sex was very limited, lurid details of secret stolen kisses and allusions to her sexual impropriety were read out in court. The Belfast News reported the opening of the trial. Mr Hanna opened the case for the prosecution. He said it was a very serious case, a case fraught with terrible consequences for all parties concerned. It was, he need hardly say to a county Antrim jury, an unusual sort of case. The solicitor Hanna couldn't avoid the wider violence breaking out across Ireland, but he would only use this to highlight the gravity of the case. The Belfast News continued to report his speech in the opening of the case. There are many things charged against the people of Ireland, but with all classes and all sections, there was one thing that had always been to the credit of this country, north, south, east and west. It was that a high standard of domestic morality had always existed from one end to the other. As the hearing continued, Alice was an unwilling participant in a strange kind of contest as she battled with the IRA for newspaper headlines as sensational reports from the courtroom were printed across local, national and even international papers. In the end, the trial verdict was the worst result possible for Alice. The jury could not agree on whether she had actually slept with her husband's cousin, Robert Hansen, when he had been in her room. This indecision meant the entire case and its details would be heard again, providing the newspapers another chance to reprint the whole story. By the time the second trial was heard, the political situation across Ireland had escalated into a full-blown war. In the months after the first trial, IRA attacks had increased through the winter of 1919 to 1920. This had seen Republicans come within seconds of killing the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, the famous general, Lord John French. By the time the second hearing began in Dublin this time, in late March 1920, hundreds of IRA prisoners in jails across Britain and Ireland had embarked on hunger strikes that would force the authorities to release them. The second trial began in the four courts in Dublin on Monday, March the 22nd and continued right through Easter into April. Having endured the humiliation of the first trial, Alice Morton had in fact left Ireland several months earlier. Unsurprisingly, she had no intention of being present at a second public humiliation. Despite this, the case went ahead and again, details of her private life were published in the press. And for a second time, the jury failed to reach a verdict in the case. The press in attendance were undoubtedly relishing the fact that it would now take a third case to resolve the matter and this would provide an excuse to publish details of the case yet again. But things would get significantly worse for Alice in the following months before this third case would start. While the death toll in Ireland began to mount in the War of Independence, her husband began his own private war against his estranged wife. After hearing sensational rumours as to her whereabouts and who she was with, he hired the Arrows Detective Agency, who tracked Alice down to Lymington in Hampshire, England. They then dispatched a female detective, Katie Schwab, to Lymington, where she found Alice in what proved a damning situation. She was living there with another soldier, a Captain Clements, claiming they were husband and wife. On learning this, her husband dropped the case against his cousin, the soldier Robert Hansen, and focused a new case against his wife's new lover, Captain Clements. This case against Clements was cast iron. While the Mortons may have been estranged and living apart, in the eyes of the law, Alice was still married to Robert Morton, and when she moved in with Captain Clements, this constituted an affair. Alice would return to Ireland for the third trial, but the country was engulfed in violence by this point. Her home in the north of Ireland had been largely free of the conflict when she left the island, but in the summer of 1920, the war had spread north and major sectarian violence had seen scores killed in Belfast. In early 1921, despite the fact the war was entering its most intense phase, the case was heard in Dublin for a third time. In events yet to come in the series, 
around 1,500 people were killed in the conflict in the first six months of that bloody year. Indeed, the war finally came to Alice's childhood home when two policemen were shot dead in Ballin Temple in County Derry in June 1921. Amidst this widespread warfare, the case still went ahead and was finally settled. Captain Clements agreed to pay Alice's husband £500 in the case of criminal conversation. The divorce case against Alice also went ahead and the couple were finally separated, but it dragged on into late 1922, when finally in November that year, they split legal costs between them. Alice Morton's case was a saga to say the least. It spanned the entire War of Independence. The country where it had started, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, no longer existed by its conclusion. It had been replaced by the Irish Free State and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Yet the case had continued right throughout the war, with a third hearing taking place as political violence was reaching its height. It serves as a reminder that in these years from 1919 to 1921, while history understandably focuses on the major events and the key actors, for many people, their lives continued, often focused on other issues. Alice Morton's experience, dominated by divorce trials and accusations of affairs, to a degree does reflect her privilege. Others had what could be considered more immediate problems. Now, Bridget Carlin was one such person. No matter how intense the War of Independence became, the poverty that shaped her day-to-day existence would remain a priority in her life. Bridget Carlin's experience of the War of Independence was very different to that of Alice Morton. Born at the turn of the 20th century, she grew up in a community in Dublin that was drowning in poverty. The Carlin family rented accommodation on Mabbitt Street, where living conditions were, in a word, shocking. The family home was a five-roomed house, which they shared with 22 people. Five families in total lived in the building, each living in just one room. Aside from the cramped conditions, Mabbitt Street, later renamed Corporation Street and then James Joyce Street, was far from ideal in terms of raising a young family. The general area was intimately known to many men from wealthier backgrounds, given it was the heart of the Monto, Dublin's extensive and notorious red light district. Given the Carlins could only afford this small room in the Monto, her parents, James and Anne, were unable to shield their children from the War of Independence in the way that, say, Alice Morton's wealth had protected her. For example, during the entire conflict from 1919 to 1921, 2,850 people were killed. The majority, nearly 60% of these, died in Ireland's three largest cities, Dublin, Cork and Belfast, or the surrounding counties of Dublin, Cork and Antrim. In the cramped urban conditions where Bridget lived, it was simply impossible to avoid or escape the violence. The Carlin home was only a few hundred metres away from the GPO, which had been the epicentre of fighting during the 1916 Rising, and 500 people had been killed in Dublin alone in the week-long insurrection. Then when the War of Independence itself began in 1919, Crown forces frequently raided houses in the Monto. Bridget undoubtedly saw people she knew arrested. On other occasions, she saw her neighbours engaged in what would probably be called in the news today suspicious activity in the dead of night, guns being moved from safe houses, people being followed by agents and the occasional shooting. This was the type of activity that most people in the Monto probably ignored and pretended they hadn't seen. However, while the War of Independence played out around them, the Carlin family, like all working class Dubliners, had problems in their daily lives that they had to contend with, regardless of whether there was a war on or not. The very basics of life, the houses in which they lived, were a constant source of fear, worry and concern. By the early 20th century, Dublin's tenements where the Carlins lived were notorious. Aside from the cramped conditions and lack of very basic sanitation, the buildings themselves were extremely dangerous. Many of the tenements, such as the buildings where Bridget Carlin and her family lived, were around 200 years old and had seen very few repairs over the previous century. It was not uncommon for these buildings to be condemned as dangerous. On Mabbitt Street, where Bridget lived, a house a few doors up from hers, number 21, had already been demolished by 1911. 
In poor weather, the inhabitants of these houses had to deal with the very real fear that their buildings could collapse. Now, this was no idle concern. Tenement houses collapsed in Dublin on an annual basis. In 1913, the collapse of two such houses on Church Street had resulted in the deaths of seven people. In January 1920, a house only a few streets away from where Bridget lived, number 85, Railway Street, collapsed with 14 people inside. Luckily, no one was killed on that occasion. Two months later, the gable of a house had collapsed on Bow Street. Again, somewhat miraculously, no one was killed in this incident either but it must have been a constant concern. Aside from fears over housing, working class women, like Bridget, faced a unique set of challenges that coincided with and were interwoven with the War of Independence. At the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, both nationalist and unionist Irish politicians had encouraged their supporters to enlist and fight for the British Empire. Now, as I mentioned earlier, over 200,000 people had answered the call and when they marched off to war, women had stepped up and filled their positions in workplaces, in many instances doing work they had previously not done. In Belfast, for example, women had been employed in munitions plants which had opened up in the city, while in other parts of Ireland, women worked on the land in increasing numbers. For the women, this was a complex experience. The work was often gruelling and hard and strikes were more or less illegal for the duration of the war. However, it was also liberating to a certain degree, as these women became financially independent of men, in some cases for the first time ever. This began to reshape their expectations and wider attitudes. For example, in 1918, Bridget Carlin could hope, at least, that she would be able to secure a job that previously would have been limited to her brother's. Now this changing role of women in society was becoming evident in the streets of Irish towns and villages as the War of Independence began. Women were beginning to wear what would traditionally have been men's clothes of trousers, leggings and short coats, basically a style that they had adopted because it facilitated agricultural work. Now while we don't know what Bridget's specific experience was, some women at least like her from Dublin found new opportunities a few miles north of the city during the First World War at a place called the Calester Farm Colony, which had been established in 1917. The farm colony was established to train young women like Bridget from Dublin on how to grow crops, something they would previously have had little or no experience of. The farm colony had been set up with several purposes in mind. Firstly, it was going to provide the women with the skills to produce food in a time when the war had upended the global system of trade, so it was ideal that Ireland could grow more food. It was also believed that getting women like Bridget Carlin out of Dublin on a daily basis was no bad thing. And as Jan O'Sullivan in her research on the colony points out, there was an ulterior political motive revealed in official correspondence at the time It is a means of absorbing unemployed labour which might otherwise be engaged in mischievous activity. Now, while the farm colony was unquestionably a welcome experience for many of the women who worked and were trained there, it would become to embody the difficulties that many of these women faced as the First World War ended and the War of Independence started. As World War I came to an end in late 1918, The advances that women had made during the conflict came under severe attack. 150,000 of the 200,000 soldiers who had gone away to war survived and in the months following the armistice that brought the conflict to an end, 100,000 of these began to arrive back in Ireland and were soon looking for work. Immense pressure was put on women to leave the workforce and make way for these veterans. The Belfast Telegraph, for example, Writing on November the 5th, six days before the war had even ended, did not even see it as a matter for discussion when it said, A great number of women workers will, no doubt, go back home to keep house for their menfolk, and others will emigrate. The women who had worked in munitions plants in Belfast were no longer required to meet what had been an insatiable demand for shells on the Western Front, and they were among the first women to be laid off. They had little hope of finding new work as the returning veterans were now demanding priority in all recruitment. These women were followed 
by their counterparts in other parts of the country who had been hired to make gloves and other garments for the army. They very quickly found out that the changes that had taken place during the war were viewed by the authorities and indeed many in wider society as temporary and they were going to force them back into their pre-war lives. It didn't take long before this affected the women at the Colester Farm Colony. Within a year of the war ending, these women being trained there were told that the project had ultimately been part of a scheme to maximise food production during the First World War and was therefore no longer needed. Instead, the land was taken from the local government board, which had trained the women, and it was instead given over to a scheme to build houses for veterans returning from the war. This would also provide these veterans with work as they would build the houses themselves. This was symptomatic of a much wider phenomenon. The end of the First World War and the start of the War of Independence spelled a time of great uncertainty for working class women like Bridget Carlin. While many would fight in the conflict, they also had concerns around looming poverty that unemployment brought, particularly if they were single. Now this was also bound up in a global recession which began in 1920 and created huge concerns for many Irish people that ran parallel to the War of Independence, as we'll see next. In the months after the end of the First World War, even though women had been pressurised to give up their jobs, the overall economy had enjoyed a short-lived boom, which, strangely, had destabilised wider society. This had been because during the First World War, while unemployment had fallen dramatically, civil liberties had been severely curtailed. Striking in many industries had been banned. Therefore, as the war ended and the economy was booming and unemployment was low, trade unions went on the offensive. They knew that their employers would be unable to find replacement workers if they made demands for higher wages and better conditions. So, for example, as the War of Independence began in Tipperary in early 1919, Belfast was convulsed by a major labour dispute. While many strikes during this period were linked to the struggle for national independence, the Belfast General Strike of January 1919 was not. The strike demanded a reduction in the working week from 54 hours to 44 hours without a reduction in pay and avoided any mention of wider political issues. Sectarian and political divisions among workers in Belfast left them severely divided over the issue of independence. Indeed, within 18 months, unionist workers launched deadly attacks on their fellow workers during the Belfast pogrom already covered in the series. The Belfast strike in January 1919, which demanded major concessions from employers, was only possible because the economy was booming at the time and unemployment was low. However, this situation did not last long, and as the War of Independence progressed, the post-war economy faltered as most of Europe dipped into recession in late 1920. Therefore, as the War of Independence entered its most intense phase from later 1920 onwards, the economy was rapidly sliding into recession, presenting increased difficulties for many in Ireland. This not only affected Ireland's small industrial sector, but also rural Ireland, where prices for agricultural goods began to fall rapidly in late 1920, resulting in major hardship. It was little wonder then that by 1920, many Irish people, regardless of whether they supported the struggle for independence or not, began to turn to the age-old Irish solution to economic problems, that is, emigration. Emigration had come to a near standstill throughout the First World War, but rapidly increased again in 1920 as 15,000 people left the island looking to start a life elsewhere. To conclude this episode, I want to change tack a bit and look at something that we rarely discuss when we talk about Ireland's revolutionary period. And that's what people did in their spare time. Because fun and entertainment, despite what we might imagine, did continue during the war and people continued to go to dances and cinema. So next I'm going to look at what people were listening to and watching and how even music became political during Ireland's War of Independence. During the War of Independence, the loyalties of wider Irish society was constantly being demanded by Crown forces on the one hand and the Republican movement on the other. As it became increasingly difficult to stand on the sidelines, the world of entertainment was presumably a welcome relief from the intensely political lives that most people were living. 
In terms of music, radio and gramophones were still in their infancy, so live music was still one of the most popular forms of entertainment. However, as the war dragged on, even musical tastes became a contested space and an expression of political views. While radical in so many ways, the Irish revolutionary movement was broadly speaking culturally very conservative. They tended to look to the past and rejected innovations in music. They argued Irish people should listen to traditional Irish music and they rejected new musical trends such as jazz that were sweeping the world at the time. They also objected to music hall tunes, the staple entertainment at the time because they were considered English. For example, at the opening of the 12th annual Father Matthew Fesh, a competition for traditional Irish music, a priest mounted the stage and launched into a tirade against the music people were hearing in Dublin dance halls. He said, I confess to a sadness of the heart whenever I bear little children singing nonsensical English songs as they pattered, ill-clad and barefooted along the streets of Dublin. There was a foul injustice done to those little ones. Their minds were injured, educationally and nationally, by absurd productions. In Dungannon, in November 1920, the IRA reportedly entered a hall where jazz music was being played. Inside the building, they instructed the Master of Ceremonies that what was deemed as English dances should not be played. Now, trying to control what people did in their spare time is rarely effective and this move naturally aroused opposition. And actually, in this instance in Dungannon, the IRA volunteers were castigated by another Republican activist who happened to be in the hall listening to the music at the time. This would, incidentally, see him hauled before a Republican court for his protest. Cinema was also a place where people went to enjoy themselves, but here too the war seeped inside the door. The War of Independence took place during the era of silent films and one of the most well-known Irish film directors of the time was John McDonough, whose brother Joseph had been executed for his leading role in the 1916 Rising. His 1920 film release, Willie Riley and his Colleen Bawn, had clear political undertones. Following the life of Willie Riley, an 18th century Catholic who fell in love with the daughter of a Protestant, their love crossed the sectarian divide. Further to film plots that were political, the conflict itself was often depicted in cinemas as well. For example, an American film crew had ventured into Belfast during the summer of 1920 and captured the sectarian violence that swept through the city at the time. While the ability to capture these events on camera undoubtedly amazed many given it was such a recent innovation, it was also presumably an unwelcome intrusion into the increasingly rare personal time people had. Over the course of this episode, I've tried to explore what life was like for those who lived through the War of Independence and what concerns they had other than the obvious political issues which dominated the news at the time. In the next episode, we'll be moving back into the war itself and we'll look at how the Republican movement, which was increasingly on the run, tried to make good on their claim to be Ireland's legitimate rulers and establish a government. This will see the first major divisions within the Republican movement emerge but also has a brilliant story of two women who operated a secret prison in their house in Dublin. It's a great story. Until then, Sloan. Sloan.